Hi, everyone, and welcome to Society's inaugural symposium. My name is Elena Zolotaryev, and I'm the president of Society. I'm also in my first year of my PhD here at the Institute of England. that you were able to join us today. Society is the School of Advanced Studies student-led organization, and while we're here for the students as much as anything, one of our aims has been to stay true to the ethos of our university, which means creating events not only catered to our students, but to a wider audience. Our objective has been to facilitate conversations that are of value, that are challenging, conversations that we believe concern everyone. As postgraduate students, we hope that we're able to shape even a little bit the world that we're in, to make it a better, brighter, more inclusive place. Natalia, our academic events officer, and I have been working really on this symposium. We spent many hours frantically texting each other in the middle of the night, thinking of what this symposium could be. Needless to say, the sky was the limit. Our chief aim was doing justice to the women of the past as well as the women of the present, while also thinking of the future. Our story. This story starts with the things we are still learning about women and their struggles through archival research, the ways in which oppression, gender, race, and class. The experience of oppression, we all know, is varied and takes many forms. But we are looking forward, thinking of what is next, ultimately celebrating the accomplishments of our contemporary thinkers that do make a difference. You will hear more about our vision behind the symposium from Natalia, who has put her heart and soul into this. This symposium simply couldn't have happened without her imagination and creativity. Our deepest thanks to the university's deputy chief executive, Elaine Wall. She motivated us, supported us, and made it possible. In her own words, International Women's Day is about celebrating and increasing the visibility of women's achievements, inspiring success, challenging views, breaking conventions, and being united in support. On a more personal note, having the opportunity to put this event together alongside Natalia has meant a lot to me. And what has meant even more is the fact that we're able to make it appealing and to have so many of you join us from different parts of the world. I envisioned an event that I would have loved to have attended when I was still in high school. For someone to tell me, here's how vibrant and big and unique the world is, where well, one doesn't have to be one, but they can be many. I hail from a part of the world where gender was very much still viewed through essentialist lenses up until recently, which means that it is your anatomy that dictates what you become, where the expectations of your being are formed around stereotypes of your gender and sexuality. While women in the UK gained the right to vote in 1918, women in Greece didn't have the right until 1952. Greece is still, in fact, the lowest ranking in the gender equality index in the European Union. Domestic violence also seems to be on the rise, having increased more than 30% the last six years, while men make up 80% of the country's parliament. I think I wouldn't have known I was a woman if I had not been reminded every step of the way. That vision of womanhood, however, was filtered through patriarchal lenses, and it is no longer something I recognize. Growing up, I was taught how to cook, how to behave, but when I looked into the mirror, I didn't necessarily understand what I was meant to be looking at. I found refuge in English literature, predominantly because no one else in my family knew the language. I kept a diary in English, I read in English, sometimes I even thought in English. When I first came across Jane Austen, I was amazed at the personhood, the agency the characters exuded. It was okay to say no after all. Still, those problems are unique to non-secular states such as Greece. Even in the United Kingdom, women are at risk on a day-to-day -day basis. As an article from Time notes, one in four women in the UK will be a victim of domestic abuse in their lifetime, while trans women are at a heightened risk. We still have a long way to go until we can speak of security and equality. We envision a world where womanhood is not deemed lesser, where all women come together in their struggle for equality, where we are able to do the very idea of womanhood justice. Because of literature, I was able to dream of the possibilities of being, of multitude that exist beyond patriarchy. On one hand, I'm thinking of Virginia Woolf's Orlando, first published in 1928. Orlando goes to sleep a man and wakes up a woman. Indeed, if Woolf shows us anything, that Orlando is as much of a woman as any of us that identify as such. Contemporary novels, such as Aquakia Mays Freshwater, 
celebrate that multiplicity of being and help us understand better the plurality of individuality. I think every woman is individually unique and our experience of the world are as distinctive and one of a kind as our fingerprints. Simone de Beauvoir's statements echoes most true when she said, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman, which is why it's important to engage with as many stories and experiences as possible. And now Sebastian tells that exact story. What does it mean to be a woman writer, a woman artist, a woman that is often discriminated against because of her gender, the color of her skin and her class? This year, keeping in the spirit of the theme of International Women's Day, we have indeed chosen to challenge and be challenged. Thinking back to the suffragettes who challenged the status quo by demanding the right to vote, thinking of the struggle to ratify the equal rights of men in the 70s in the United States for equal legal rights for all American citizens, and even the latest uproars in Poland to overthrow the near total ban on abortions, we have learned that it is precisely challenging dominant cultures that brings about change. We are delighted that you have joined in on the conversation, and we cannot wait to hear your thoughts, questions, and contributions, which you'll be able to share with us at the end of each panel. Okay, now I'm passing on the torch to Natalia, who will tell you more about the symposium. And I do hope you find the events inspiring and motivating. I just want to reiterate once again how excited we are to have you here. Okay, Natalia, on to you. Hello, everybody. And once again, welcome to Society's International Women's Day Symposium, the first of what we hope will be an annual event. Um, my name is Natalia Fantetti, and as well as being the Academic Events Officer for Society, I'm a second year PhD student in the IES, working as part of the Cultivate MSS team. Firstly, I'd just like to reiterate a little bit of what Eleanor has said uh, in thanking everyone today the panelists, the chairs, everyone who is attending, my fellow committee members, and of course, my co-organizer and symposium partner in crime, Eleanor. Because the fact of the matter is that an event like this only works when we come together as a collective. As Audre Lorde once said, without community, there is no liberation. Women's equality will not come about through one single person, but rather through the efforts of one united whole. And so it is in this spirit of community and of actively listening to one to perspectives that are perhaps different from our own that we place our symposium. It was important to me in the setting up of this event that both academics and creatives were represented across the board. The twin sisters of the academy and the arts are after all critical tools for change. In challenging what has gone before, whether by unearthing forgotten histories that have been hidden in the archives or previous scholarship, or by presenting the reader, the viewer, the artistic consumer with something that captures their imagination in a new way. These sisters can provoke change. The panels we are putting on today are designed to help us think critically about the continuing fight for equality and the numerous issues that stem from it. In panel one, retrieving women from the archives, we will be taking the term archive in its fullest sense encompassing everything from literal scholarly excavation to uh, from archives themselves to notions of narratives and the canon, whatever that might be. Panel two, feminism and intersectionality, will tackle the additional difficulties that women may face, whether that is down to race, class or gender identity. Our third panel, the future of feminism, will present three different viewpoints or, on where we might go from here and the possibilities that the feminist movement opens up to us. The day will be rounded off with an in conversation with event with the novelist Angie Cruz, a writer who consistently puts women and women's issues at the forefront of her work. Events such as this symposium are necessary due to the fact that we are living in a fundamentally inequitable society. The gender pay gap is a lie and well, with it only widening if you look at women of colour in particular. In the UK, almost one in three women aged 16 to 59 will experience domestic abuse in her lifetime. According to UNICEF, across the world, 132 million girls are out of school and only 66% of countries have achieved gender parity in primary education. Furthermore, According to a poll conducted by the Pew Research Center last year, four in 10 men in the United States say the term feminist describes them at least somewhat well. Now to me, at least somewhat well 
is not what I would call entirely convincing support until the majority of men are not only tolerant of, but advoc active advocates for equality, we will not live in an equal society. Feminism is important for everybody, and the act of calling oneself a feminist need not be limited to those who identify as women. For women's issues are human issues, and we are all human after all. All of that being said, there has undoubtedly been progress on both a slow generational scale and in quicker, more recent changes. This I know to be true on a personal level. Both of my grandmothers were denied the chance of further education. One learnt her letters and numbers and worked in the fields until she got married and came to England. The other did not get to go past middle school simply because she was one of seven with two older brothers who supposedly needed an education more than she did and there was only so much money to go around. Their granddaughter is now getting her doctorate. And all around the world, we are making progress one bill, one appointment, one protest at a time. In 2020 alone, in the midst of the pandemic, Sudan banned FGM, Spain approved a law to count all non-consexual sex as rape, Scotland prayed period products free, and the USA elected its first female vice president, and New Zealand passed the Equal Pay Amendment Bill. These are just a few of the wins that we have achieved, even in the most trying of circumstances. My mother was, and still is, fond of saying to me, how can you expect others to, expect, uh, to respect you if you don't respect yourself first? Now respect here is not about the clothes you wear or the company you keep. As she explained it to me, respecting yourself is about staking your claim as an equal member of society, saying, I have a right to be here. I have a right to be heard. I have a right to be proud. The grand table of society has not always handily offered us a seat. And so instead we make like Shirley Chisholm and bring our folding chairs instead. Each of us has a story to tell or an opinion to give that deserves to be heard and shared. To quote the great feminist activist Gloria Steinem, every movement has come from people sharing their stories. And for me, this is the crux of today's event. We are here to have conversations. For conversations create movements and movements create change. And so let us get on with those very conversations and get started with the first of our panels today. Thank you. Um, I think now we can get our panelists and our chair to switch well, on their cameras. There we go. And Professor Catherine Davies, please take it away. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Elena and Natalia. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I think you've done wonders to organize this conference today. Thank you so much. I'm going to chair the first panel, uh, which is called Retrieving Women from the Archives. And each speaker, there's three speakers, and each speaker will speak for 15 minutes. And I'd like to thank the speakers before we start for coming along and sharing their thoughts with us. After each speaker has spoken, we will have a Q&A. Um, and we should be finished by about quarter past one, if that's all right. So I'm going to introduce the three speakers all together now, and then uh, when each is finished, we'll pass on to the next one. Okay, so our first speaker is Professor Sarah Churchwell, um, my colleague. Hello, Sarah. Um, Sarah's at the Institute of English Studies in the School of Advanced Study. Her research focuses on American literature, culture, and history in the long 20th century. And her research topics include a rhetorical history of the phrases American dream and America first, <laughs> histories and readings of the great Gatsby, American language in the 1920s and 1930s, classical Hollywood cinema, and iconic American figures such as Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, Marilyn Monroe, Sylvia Plath, Henry James, and Margaret Mitchell. And her talk today is entitled In Search of Fugitive Histories, Rereading the Mass Archive. <laughs> 
So um, Sarah will speak first. And then our second speaker is Francesca Wade. Francesca is a best-selling author who studied classics and women's studies at Oxford. She has written for the London Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, Financial Times, Paris Review, The Guardian, New Statesman, Prospect, among others. She is outgoing editor of the White Review, a recipient of a Robert B. Silvers grant for work in progress. And in 2021, a fellowship at the Leon Levy Center for Biography. Her first book, Square Haunting, was a Sunday Times Literary Nonfiction Book of the Year, a Guardian Best Book of the Year, as chosen by authors, and also long listed for the Bailey Gifford Prize. So her talk today uh, is entitled Laundry Lists and Manifestos. So thank you, Francesca, uh, and welcome. And our last speaker, our third speaker, is my colleague from the Institute of Modern Languages Research, Dr. Godella Weiss-Sussex, who is a reader. She works on the culture and literature of 20th and 21st century, uh, particularly women's writing. The works of German Jewish writers produced in Germany and in exile, modernism, the city in literature and the visual arts, and biology and literature. And her current research project focuses on German Jewish women's writing in the 20th and 21st centuries as minor literature, also metropolitan com consumer culture, and the literary imagination. And her talk today is entitled, But Are They Any Good? Researching German Jewish Women Writers of the Early 20th Century. So without further ado, I'll go away and I'll pass on to Sarah. Sarah? Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And um, I'd like to add my thanks and congratulations uh, to yours, to Ellen, <laughs> Elena, uh, uh, who I do know, I do know her name, um, and Natalia for um, organizing this opportunity for us to come together today to honor women in the archive. As Catherine said, my uh, title today is um, In Search of Fugitive Histories, Rereading the Mass Archive. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about methods um, in the Mass Archive, as well as about some of the ideas um, behind them. As I was working on this paper, I realized that it could well have an alternative title, um, which will become clear as I go, um, which is that as well as being in search of fugitive histories, it's also in search of ungovernable histories. In seeking to understand the lives of ordinary people and broaden our socio-political and historical understandings, especially the historical workings of justice and more pertinently, injustice, historians have long sought to recover marginalized voices in the archive. Official discourses variously excluded, overlooked, suppressed, distorted, pathologized or criminalized non-normative experiences and identities including gender and sexuality, but also, of course, race and ethnicity, physical disability, mental illness, addiction, and so on. This fact is, I take it, the starting point for our symposium today, um, asking the question of how we can recover voices that were lost to the historical record, or rather buried in the mass archive. And one of the reasons I want to, to make that turn there is because I want to suggest the ways in which that burial was um, uh, in many ways a deliberate one. I've come to think of the mass archive, by which I mean all of the newspapers, all of the books, all of the magazines and advertisements, the periodicals, the blogs, the internet, as, as it explodes and implodes around us every day in constellations of data. The mass archive is also a mass grave. And I mean that in all of its brutality and anonymity. But as with any mass grave, we can undertake archeological excavations. And although those, those may begin with a bulldozer, very soon 
we need more precise and delicate instruments to handle the fragility of the archival remains. We need nimble and careful considered approaches that let us excavate without doing damage to what we seek. In historical work, one of the primary ways we can do damage to our evidence is through cherry picking that distorts the record so that we only pick the remains from the mass archive that we choose and thus draw incorrect inferences, putting the pieces together wrong like a misassembled dinosaur because we mistook a femur for the tail. So how do we trace the fugitive? How do we chase the fugitive without pushing it further away or breaking our fragile connection to it altogether? What I want to do today in the few minutes I have is sketch out one way that I approach the problem, but I want to do so in dialogue with another scholar who has recently published a wonderful book that many of you will know, who approaches the same problem in the same era um, that I do in similar ways, um, but with enough difference for us to have a dialogue. Um, that book is Sadia Hartman's 2019 Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval, which she describes as exploring the limits of the archive. It's a creative encounter with the archival traces of young black women in the 1920s whose, whose lives did not conform to the master narratives of their day. Hartman writes, every historian of the multitude, the dispossessed, the subaltern and the enslaved is forced to grapple with the power and authority of the archive and the limits it sets on what can be known whose perspective matters, and who is endowed with the gravity and authority of historical actor. In her book, she has created, she says, a counter narrative liberated from the judgments and classification within the archival documentation that subjected these women to surveillance, arrest, punishment, and confinement. And she tries to open up their experiences to resist that um, archival writing to recover what she calls the insurgent ground of their lives and particularly to exhume open rebellion from the case file. That's her um, phrase. And I was struck by it because I, as you heard, uh, I was already thinking in terms of the metaphor of excavation and then was encountering Hartman thinking about exhumation um, and, and this attempt to exhume, excavate um, stories from the case file, from the archival record, and to reframe them, to rethink them. As I say, I've been engaged in a project that is in many ways analogous, working in the gaps of the official historiography, digging into the archives in different ways, uh, releasing what has been called a fetish for detail, um, and seeing how these details work synecdocally to suggest a world but also how we might rewrite and resist some of the dominant paradigms that frame what we find in the archives, reading them against the grain of intentionality, um, which is certainly what Hartman is doing and is a very literary way of reading. She writes that she thinks of her book as the fugitive text of the wayward. And I read that phrase as I was literally drafting my own essay, uh, not this one, but another essay that had a working title of fugitive histories. So we were approaching this with the same heuristic metaphors, exhumation and excavation and fugitive histories, fugitive stories, fugitive texts that we were digging into and, um, and tracing. She calls her book an archive of the exorbitant and notes that the girls whose lives she recovers constituted, quote, a revolution before Gatsby. Now, as anyone who knows my work knows, Catherine mentioned this in her introduction, I've been working on Gatsby for many years now and understanding that era through its archives, reframing it to change our contexts and resist received wisdoms, um, which has been central uh, certainly to all of my books and to most of my um, published work. But because my foundational interests are always in language and narrative, I try to build archival patterns around words as well as around people. And I wanted to talk a little bit um, now about how that can work um, and in this kind of uh, dialogic way. Because if you're tracing words, um, you will, as I'm going to explain, you will uncover things that you didn't necessarily expect. But one of the things that you will uncover is people that you didn't expect to find because you find that the language reveals the voices. And obviously it is people who are doing the speaking and the writing and the thinking. Um, and so tracing words instead of people 
creates different pathways through the mass archive, bringing different figures to our attention, bringing them back to view. And it means we can turn histories on their heads. So I'm gonna briefly show how that works with one example that Hartman uses um, several times in her book, when she notes that the word ungovernable was a trope used against black women by the regime of social workers and social records. Social reformers pathologized black women and girls as ungovernable, the incorrigible child, the disorderly woman who becomes an irredeemable person. So Hartman writes about one of her women, Esther Brown, stitching together a few phrases from the records um, of a correctional home to imagine her way into Esther Brown's personality. Hartman is explicit that, this is, that hers is an imaginative reconstruction necessitated by the huge gaps in the archive. Her book is a work of extrapolation, imagining whole narratives from snippets of loaded phrases like ungovernable. So very briefly, here's what she says about Esther Brown from uh, the word ungovernable in the uh, historical record. The brutality that Esther experienced at the Hudson Training School for Girls taught her to fight back, to strike out. The teachers told the authorities that she had enjoyed too much freedom. It had ruined her and made her into the kind of young woman who would not hesitate to smash things up. Freedom in her hands, if not a crime, was an offense and a threat to public order and moral decency. Excessive liberty had ruined her. The social worker concurred, quote, with no social considerations to constrain her, she was ungovernable. Social work here is not just social labor, but social control. Once we notice that such a word, ungovernable, comes laden with the connotations of what we now call misogynoir, that is to say the uniquely brutal intersectional nexus of misogyny and racism to which black women continue to be subjected, we could, for example, trace the ungovernable through the modern archive with a pretty good hunch that it was likely to turn up black women. The bulldozer technique that I mentioned at the beginning would be to look in the digital archive for ungovernable and black women, but that would be to create classic experimental bias and ensure that you only found what you were looking for. It would also, if you tried to do it that way, by the way, and this is just kind of a word to the wise, um, if you tried to do it that way, you wouldn't find very much um, because black girl was not a phrase that was very often in use at the time. If you search in 1918 for articles about the First World War or World War I, you won't find a thing because there hadn't been a second one yet. And so no one called it the First World War. They called it the Great War, the late conflict and so on. So you have to have a sensitivity to historical language uses to uncover what you're looking for. And even if you seek prominent women at the time, like for example, Zelda Fitzgerald, if you look for Zelda Fitzgerald, you may come to the erroneous conclusion that she wasn't much represented in the archive, but it's because you're looking in the wrong place. She will be hiding in plain sight as Mrs. F. Scott Fitzgerald at a time when women were largely known by the names of their husbands. So even if we want to see ungovernable black women in the mass archive, we can't look for African-American women or we won't find them. We will have to look for the words that were used at the time Primarily in the US context, of course, that word would have been Negro if we're looking for official documentation. But if we're looking for unofficial vernacular responses, especially in the South, we will need to be willing to search for terms we find very offensive and they used very casually. So on the one hand, we have to be alert to historical language uses. And on the other hand, we have to avoid experimental bias by not cherry picking what we're looking for. If you do a simple newspaper archive search as a kind of wild card for the word ungovernable between 1900 and 1930 without Negro or any other racial marker that skews your evidence, you will find a, a, a much richer and more open context in which to understand the language that Hartman is tracing here. I haven't done this in any depth, but a quick search reveals that the top hits for the word ungovernable are with the word temper an ungovernable temper. And for the most part, um, the first tranche of them is actually about men with ungovernable tempers, um, it, what in a context that we would probably describe as toxic masculinity and certainly domestic violence. Now it's still construed in highly gendered terms, um, but it was actually um, the problem of ungovernability was not by any means uh, limited 
to young black women. Um, so on the one hand, we have what we could call toxic masculinity that is troped as ungovernable temper, but it doesn't take long. It took me about half an hour if you just keep sampling more examples, um, to discover that the vast majority of the times that the word ungovernable was used was to describe young people, not adults, uh, some of whom were boys, many of whom were girls, most of whom appear to have been white, because of course we're looking at a moment when black people were so irrelevant to American society that they didn't make it into the official records, which is of course Hartman's starting point, the point of radical marginalization. There were many articles about what to do with the problem of the ungovernable child. And across America, uh, parents would bring their ungovernable children to court and accuse them before a judge of being ungovernable. It was a legal charge. In 1911, a Brooklyn paper reported that a father had brought his 13-year-old daughter to court and charged her with being an ungovernable child because she had been raised by a wealthy cousin of his. They had then found her difficult Sent, him, sent her back to her biological father, who tried to raise her for all of two weeks before deciding that she was so disobedient and so problematic that he would take her to court and charge her with being ungovernable because she refused to help about the house and kept finding fault with her surroundings. The court sent Florence Smith, aged 13, to a correctional home for a week to teach her a lesson that her father was incapable of teaching her um, after two whole weeks of single parent custody. Um, and, it's, and this is how it was reported. The court decided to give Florence a taste of life at the shelter of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, um, where many children brought up differently from Florence have been glad to go. So it will teach her a lesson, teach her to be happy in her home for one week um, in this correctional facility, and then she will be brought back to court and asked if she will be satisfied with her father's home. Such children were frequently committed to correctional facilities like the Hudson Training School for Girls that Hartman's story of Esther Brown invokes. And if we look for ungovernable girls, we discover the Hudson School for Girls in the archives very rapidly, defending its methods against accusations of harshness. For example, in 1915, when the chairman of the state parole board defended its policy of taping young girls' mouths shut, um, the measure of plastering over the mouth of an uncontrollable, impudent girl who is quite relentless in her insolence and backtalk. Uh, and then he says, uh, the enforced silence brings them to reflection and is thoroughly justified by the good results in practice um, because uh, girls raving in filthy obscenities must be promptly subdued. So what we have here is a legal and judicial and cultural discourse, a classic Foucauldian power structure, in other words, disciplining unruly lives and bodies through the discourse of ungovernability, as well as at times through physical punishment and imprisonment. Ungovernable could denote petty transgressions such as truancy or loitering, or indeed, as in this example, insolence and backtalk or obscene language. If someone taped over my mouth, I'd probably swear at them too. And here we have a very literal example of silencing the ungovernable girl in the archive. But still, it leaves a trace of these girls' resistant, obscene language, their insolent backtalk as self-defense and defiance. There were also social reform groups like the Christian Service League, which in 1922 had control of 357 children and gave talks, hosted talks on ungovernable girls from county probation officers and the like. So it's a whole discourse um, across the country. Often uh, the accounts at the time did not register the race of these children, but they did register their ethnicity in the 1920s. Um, a time of great xenophobia in uh, American life in 1925, a year after the passage of America's most restrictive anti-immigration legislation in its history. Um, one New York report noted how many children of immigrant communities were uh, ungovernable, how many Polish children were ungovernable, how many Russian children were ungovernable. And obviously you can see the eugenicist sorts of arguments that would rapidly um, be extrapolated from that. 
So what do we conclude from adding this context to Hartman's research? Not that it doesn't matter that African-American girls and women were also deemed ungovernable. On the contrary, it shows us that it was a master trope, a dominant paradigm into which they were violently inserted. And of course, ungovernable as a trope is racially charged at a time when criminality and licentiousness were also racialized. But the point is that it didn't only apply to African-American girls, rather that when it was applied to them, misogynoir kicked in and amplified its meanings and its punishment. So this is one of the ways I trace fugitive or ungovernable histories by following a trope, a bit of vernacular, a code, and seeing who it turns up. As I say, this has a way of bringing up stories and figures who are lost but present in the mass archives and whose stories in aggregate can help us understand the dominant discourses creating the contexts in which we read the historical uses and misuses of the archive. So language here is my kind of bait on the fishing line where it's a net that lets me trawl through the record seeing what it catches rather than setting out to hook one specific fish. I find it useful not least because by definition in a more discreet and conventional society than our own, such non-normative behaviors were habitually occluded in official records by coded language conventions like this one. For Hartman, in anonymity and gaps, there is freedom. Freedom from the Foucauldian surveillance mechanisms of the modern record regime that began in both the US and the UK in the first decades of the 19th century. Freedom is a principle but it's also a theory, a way of, and, and a praxis. It's a way of doing and making and creating and thinking. And for women, historically bound and subject in myriad ways, including subject to language restrictions, to literally being taped over their mouths for saying the wrong words, these were limitations in saying and knowing and speaking and signing to which men were historically not subject. That freedom for women becomes at once more problematic and more profound. It creates a gap into which women fall, prey to their own silences and to the oppressive silence of the mass grave, left to be recalled, if they are recalled at all, in the whispers or gossip or rebukes they inspired or provoked in those around them. Freedom, being ungovernable, is possibility and it is pitfall, but it is through the trace of ungovernable words that we can find them and here the word ungovernable becomes itself ungovernable because it is no longer doing the work that its speakers and authors intended it to do in history. We have unleashed the ungovernable and are using it against them, turning their language into our power. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for a very compelling and in fact disturbing uh, opening talk, thank you, gives us a lot to think about. Um, I'll now pass over to Francesca. Francesca, are you there? Yeah? <laughs> okay. I'm here. Uh, there should be some sort of place for applause <laughs> for Sarah. Thanks so much for such a wonderful presentation, which has given so much to think with. Um, and I'm going to take up your idea of anonymity and gaps as being suggestive tempting sites to, to exhume um, in my presentation. Um, thanks so much to you all for this invitation. It's really exciting to be here to celebrate International Women's Day in such great company. Um, I will be talking about researching my first book, Square Haunting, which was published in early 2020, um, which is a group biography told through the lives of five women writers who are linked by the fact that they all lived in London's Mecklenburg Square at various points between the two world wars. I spent five years researching the book and pursuing these women across the world, reading their letters and diaries and their own writing, trying to reconstruct the narratives of their lives, thinking about the ways they thought of themselves, the way they related to other women, to their workplaces, to history and to the future they all wanted to see. The project was slightly unusual in that it began from a pure coincidence. I began the book in 2013 when I discovered that two writers I'd long read and admired, the imagist poet HD and the novelist publisher essayist Virginia Woolf had lived in the very same London square 
during different world wars, where they both wrote extensively and powerfully about the horrors of air raids and the mundanity of waiting for death, separated by 20 years, but only a few yards. I was immediately intrigued by this uncanny serendipity. And when I looked up the square online, I was fascinated to discover how many other pioneering women writers had made their homes in the very same place during the same period. I chose to explore the lives of five women, H.D. and Wolfe, but also the detective novelist Dorothy L. Sayers, the economic historian and pacifist Eileen Power, and the classicist Jane Harrison, each of whom spent time in the square between 1916 and 1940. The challenge I had was to weave a narrative from the coincidence of their shared address to combine these women's lives in a way that would deepen an understanding of each one individually and to use my research into their biographies to tell a wider story about women's lives in this period of rapid change that would be rooted in a specific time and place. As Sarah has, has already pointed out, archival work into women's lives is often fraught with all sorts of difficulties, literary, ethical and practical. It's often assumed that archives are somehow objective, that their job is simply to collect and preserve the important effects of the past. But the stories they tell are entirely framed by the whims of many people, of subjects themselves who may have reason to keep things private, of their literary executives who may have their own reasons to want to hide secrets or facts they consider shameful, um, and of the historians, archivists who make decisions as to what history is considered worth preserving for future researchers. Often women's papers aren't systematically preserved, it's been widely discussed how little space is given in archives to women's stories, making it often difficult for future generations to, to know their history. In her 1929 essay, A Room of One's Own, which became a kind of guiding force for my book, Virginia Woolf draws attention to this imbalance and to its effects on women's imaginations and their conceptions of themselves and their potential as well as their history. We look back through our mothers if we are women, she says, and she urges her audience. The paper was originally delivered as at a um, Cambridge Women's College. Um, so she urges the audience of women students to write about their mothers and their grandmothers, about their friendships with other women and about themselves in order to create a tradition of subversive women's writing for future generations to build on. Wolf argues there that for centuries, women have been deprived of knowing their history by historians focusing their research and their narratives on the public deeds of great men and not making room in their history books and their archives for the everyday activities of women, ordinary lives of ordinary people, which she argues is of, is of just as much human interest as stories of kings and wars. And Wolfe connects this, as she often does, to her experience of walking around the city of London, encountering at every turn statues of great bearded statesmen erected in celebration of their service to empire. She writes powerfully here and elsewhere of the kind of disconnect of living and working out who she is as a writer and as a woman in a city which makes clear that she isn't part of its story. But there was one statue in London which Wolf loved and which you can still see today, an anonymous woman kneeling down to pour water from an urn which stands outside the gates of the Foundling Hospital on Guildford Street in Bloomsbury. Wolf wrote that she found this statue very suggestive of an alternative hidden history and added, I would venture to guess that Anon, who wrote so many poems without signing them, was often a woman. This idea became the basis of a book that she was writing at the time of her death in 1941, which was going to be a story of English literature told through the character of Anonymous, giving voice to the lives of people like the fictional sister of Shakespeare, whose story she had imagined in a room of one's own, rejected at every turn, refused every opportunity given to her brother, eventually dying pregnant and unknown at a London crossroads. Wolf's ambition was to write a history which laid bare the forces that invisibly shape lives, giving some people advantages and making life impossible for others of equal talent to succeed. These ideas became central to my conception of my own project, and I discovered that it was also central to the work of each of these women, who all, in different ways, worked to write women's lives in new ways, whether that was through excavating the past in works of history, writing poetry or fiction that gave voice to female characters, or writing about their own selves. In particular, I want to mention another of my subjects, a pioneering woman's historian whose work Virginia Woolf read while she was at work researching that final book, which only survives, by the way, in a few um, chapters under, under synopsis. <clears throat> 
Jane Harrison was one of the first women to study at Cambridge University. After she left college, she spent decades applying for academic jobs and being rejected, often explicitly because she was a woman. Instead, she forged a new sort of scholarly career outside of the academy. She toured the country lecturing to working men's clubs, to school children, to mother and baby groups, cobbling together a living from freelance work and living cheaply in boarding houses she shared with other single women. But her position as an outsider led her to shake the very foundations of classical scholarship itself. She travelled in the sort of latter part of the 19th century around Europe and the Middle East, gathering new evidence from the archaeological digs that were, that were happening across the continent um, to formulate theories which would challenge everything historians and classicists at that point thought they knew about the past. In her 50s, finally, she was invited back to Newnham College, one of the first women's colleges at Cambridge, and offered a permanent position. And it was with that time and space, that room of her own, that she was able finally to write the works for which she's now remembered, which challenged the popular perception of Greek religion and shocked the establishment. Harrison suggested that behind the well-known male gods, familiar from Greek tragedy and epic poetry, lay a forgotten history of mother goddess worship, that once women had been central to community worship in, form, in cults dedicated to powerful female goddesses, whose worship was later erased and their powers reattributed to male gods as women's status in society was gradually eroded. Harrison's books proved that women had been systematically written out of history, and it's ironic to think how close she herself came to being unable to write any books at all, not due to a lack of talent or determination, but due to the precarious conditions she was forced to work in as a female scholar. Harrison left Cambridge in 1921, furious at its refusal to offer women degrees and spent her final years in Paris and London translating Russian literature with her partner and former student, Hope Merlees. Harrison's life is difficult to reconstruct from the archive. She burned many of her personal papers after she left Cambridge and scholars and her, uh, first at the time, her friends and later generations of biographers and scholars have speculated on whether Hope Merlees coerced her into it or whether it was Harrison herself who wanted to make a totally fresh start. After she died, male contemporaries and collaborators were often credited for the work that she did and her name gradually fell out of history books. Later research and new technologies meant that some of her theories ended up being sort of discredited or but notwithstanding the fact that her work made possible future work by scholars who could only do as they did by building on the foundations that she had laid. Harrison's and Merley's relationship is difficult to understand with so little evidence beyond the vague, vague rumours and speculations of people who knew them, and often relationships which can't easily be mapped onto the traditional heterosexual paradigm get lost to history, systematically ignored or buried or euphemised, till later researchers are left with little material to give a full portrait of the texture of a relationship which clearly still was the most significant of both women's lives. A.S. Byatt wrote of archives that people often leave no record of the most critical or passionate moments of their lives. They leave laundry bills and manifestos. In the course of researching my book, I was often frustrated by the gaps and lacunae in the material that was available to me, where I could tell that certain documents had either been doomed, deemed unsuitable for future eyes or had assumed simply not to be of interest. But in working with women's archives, I think these gaps will always be part of the story since they represent the material facts of so many women's lives and the forces that affect them every day, the very forces which prevent women often from achieving their potential in their lifetimes, which are the same ones that also prevent their work from being adequately remembered. The women in my book were constantly demeaned, written off, told how they should behave and what they should write about, but their work and the way they lived shows their determination to create templates from which future generations of women might learn. Wolf's essay, A Room of One's Own, signifies a physical space where a woman can work without interruption, a luxury refused to so many women throughout history. But that room also signifies a place in society where her work will be taken seriously, where she will be free to express herself as an individual, not be constrained by expectations of femininity, where she will not be excluded from education and from institutions, but will find ways of flourishing, fulfilling her potential.
This, I think, is what each of these women were hoping for when they arrived in Mecklenburg Square and set up home in Bloomsbury, an area that at that time was cheap, known for its proliferation of affordable housing in single rooms or flats, a place which would enable them each to find their voices as writers and pursue the work they wanted to do. Wolf's essay explores the question of what conditions are needed for a woman to write, which is a question that all the women in my book asked as they moved into their new houses and reflected on what sort of home they wanted to live in. As they set up their lives as writers, each of them thought deeply about whether or not to have children, whether a relationship would nourish them or curtail their talents, whether they would benefit from the support of an institution or find their communities through friends and collaborators outside the structures of academia or work. By the time I finished the book, I realized that what brought these women together beyond this coincidence of their address was their determination to find new forms of living, to write about women as they had not been written about before, to devote their lives to work, and to find a way of living which would enable them to do that, despite the challenges they faced as women wanting to be heard in a public world, world still geared towards men. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, really inspiring. And um, I hope we can pick up on some of the points you've made there later on in the questions. Um, and. We're on time, and I'll now move on to our third speaker, so uh, Dr. Godela Weiss-Sussex, and her title is, but are they any good? Researching German Jewish women writers in the early 20th century. So hand over to you, Godela. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, and thank you uh, also, of course, to uh, Elena and Natalia for setting all this up. Um, my, my talk is, is a natural follow-on to um, what Sarah and Francesca have spoken about, because I will be speaking about uh, the importance of paying attention to women's own traditions, women's own voices, their determination. But while doing so, the uh, importance of resisting received wisdoms and to exhume open rebellion. Um, so all this ties up um, very, very well indeed. Now, I just have to sort of jump through the hoop of finding, setting up my, um, my shared screen. I'll just do that. Um, and, okay. Um, there we go. Right, so, but are they any good? Uh, this is a question I have been asked many times, either implicitly or explicitly. And every time I've been wondering, what does this question even mean? Doesn't it imply an assumption that if I haven't heard about it, it can't be any good? But quality judgments such as good and bad are not abstract measures. They are determined by tradition and social context, and they are also influenced by ideology and personal taste. So in other words, it's not the authors and their works, but the question itself that needs to come under scrutiny. So please keep the question in mind while I tell you about the text I've been retrieving from the archives. They are novels by German Jewish women authors about what it was like to be a Jewish woman living in Berlin in the early 20th century. At the origin of this research was a certain frustration with the continuing emphasis in German Jewish studies on the work of canonical male authors. I'm sure you've all heard of uh, Kafka, Schnitzler, but when asked about, you know, who were the women writing at that period, it becomes a bit more difficult to answer. So I was interested in the voices of women writers and particularly in the question of how Jewish women construct their self-image in literary texts, how they reflect and reflect upon their experience of being ascribed a double minority status as Jews and women. I concentrated my study on Berlin writers in the period between 1900 and 1918. Berlin in those years was a hub of German Jewish intellectual and artistic activity and a barometer of German Jewish relations. In those early 1900s, most German Jews especially those from the highly educated middle classes, regarded themselves as Germans first and foremost. The project of assimilation that had been going on for centuries was being continued. 
At the same time, however, anti-Semitic discourses gathered momentum too. It is not surprising then that many German Jewish writers suppressed the Jewish component of their identity because it implied difference, otherness. But it is the few who explicitly took a stand and discussed their complex hyphenated identity, those who actively participated in societal discourses that I focused on. So let me tell you briefly about three of these authors and their work. They are, I think, paradigmatic in a way because they are as different from one another as is possibly imaginable. And so their work may indicate the range of possibilities of German Jewish politically engaged writing in the period concerned. So all three novels are firmly rooted in autobiographical experience. Uh, first, we have Augusta Hauschner's two volume novel, Die Familie Lovositz and Rudolf and Camilla, uh, which tell the story of a German Jewish brother and sister in two interweaving strands. So, really, the, the novel is woven together like a plait. The narrative strand concerned with Camilla Lovositz, so that the girl concentrates on her experience of a loveless childhood and an arranged marriage. And we have Greta Meisel Hess, The Intellectuellen, The Intellectuals, a novel propagating a biologistic new ethic with a young heroine, Olga, who self confidently promotes socialist, radical feminist, and eugenic reform. Uh, and then we have Elisabeth Landau, uh, who wrote under the pseudonym Outnal. Um, uh, and her novel, Der Holzweg, uh, already as early as in 1918, condemns the striving for German Jewish assimilation as futile, as Holzweg, a dead end, and discusses the options for the way ahead. So the leading voice in this novel is that of the protagonist, Elise, who makes the case for emigration to England. So we see radically different concerns and structures here, but there's also some interesting common ground. Let's look first at the construction of Jewishness. As I was saying earlier, these authors thinking about Jewishness is in all cases, a confrontation with an aspect of their own identity, whether ascribed by others or accepted through their own choosing, their own identity that is seen as other by the German hegemonial culture. But beyond an indication of difference, what does Jewishness mean to them and how do they talk about it? Hauschner describes Jewish femininity as a psychological burden that results from the patriarchal structures of Jewish society. The question that Hauschner puts at the center of Camilla's story is whether it is possible to break free from this burden. For Meisel Hess, in contrast, Jewishness is mental strength, an emotional and intellectual energy Working with contemporary discourses of Jewish intelligence, the topos of the smart Jew, enables her to construct the ascribed otherness as a positive feature on the basis of which she can present her Jewish protagonists as leaders for political and social reform. Elisabeth Landau finally defines Jewishness as an ethical position, as the conscious decision to accept commonality with a people that is denigrated and excluded by the so-called Aryan German majority, and to derive a defiant pride from this exclusion. So in Hauschner, we see the focus on suffering. The other two display a distinct pride in their Jewishness. Meisel Hess in confident self-assertion, Landau in bitterness and defiance. And it's really important there also to look at the time of writing, you know, they are, they are mirroring um, the situation of Jews in Germany before the First World War and after. In all three novels, we see a narrative of female liberation from a constricting petit bourgeois of environment, a trajectory of growth and fulfillment. And all three novels claim a significance that goes way beyond the narrative of individual experience. These texts and their heroines are carriers of reformist ideas of models for social progress and a better future. Female experience becomes a claim for female leadership. And this claim is in all cases linked to a concept of motherhood. But again, in a surprising variety of ways. Hauschner's Camilla 
finds a way to oppose patriarchal Jewish dogma through embracing motherhood. Maito Hesse's Olga, who leaves the provincial backwardness of her hometown and settles in Berlin, becomes a leading speaker for the radical feminist League for the Protection of Mothers, the Bund für Mutterschutz. She fights against the institution of marriage and campaigns for all women's right to motherhood, independent of their marital status, as crucial part in the national effort towards improving the nation. And Landau finally builds the leadership role that is attributed to her Elisa on her experience and responsibility as a mother. Elisa's rejection of Germany, her emigration to England with her young son, are constructed to represent a specifically female, life-giving, nurturing principle. So in all cases, the concept of motherhood bolsters narratives of cultural renewal and, perhaps more surprisingly, of emancipation. In fact, it's used to leg legitimize positions that oppose established norms and majority thinking in a progress-oriented progress and forward-looking way. So how do they do it? What are the literary strategies they use? Meisel Hess, the middle one, uh, works with scientific discourse to underpin her proposals for change. Hauschner and Landau take the route of going with a particularly German-Jewish genre, the Zeitroman, contemporary novel, which was a type of panoramic social novel. But they use this popular genre in order to transport new, unexpected content and in a kind of revolution from inside to oppose dominant discourses within the Jewish majority. Hauschner to denounce the practice of arranged marriage and Landau to condemn the continued pursuit of a German-Jewish symbiosis in the face of unprecedented levels of anti-Semitic agitation. All three women's writing allows a perspective that disrupts established ways of thinking and offers suggestions of a different future. They go beyond binary distinctions between German and German-Jewish points of view by adding specifically female perspectives and a whole variety of them. Now, in order to hear these voices, you have to go back to the archives. They are not readily available, they are no longer in print. And sometimes, in order to hear these voices, you have to hack your way through a thicket, not only of neglect and disinterest, but also of discrimination and vilification. When I started out on this research, most of these women's works have been hardly taken notice of before. And yet, even if very little had, had been said about them, I found that they had been misrepresented, and at times quite fundamentally so. So here is what these novels are not, but what they have been claimed to be by researchers and by uh, reviewers at the time. Hauschner's Familie Lovositz is not a Bildungsroman focused on a young man, Rudolf, whose Jewishness is all but incidental. In fact, the novel is firmly built on the double strand structure, the parallel psychological study of brother and sister. And the sister's story is actually given precedence by the author in many ways. As for the Jewish culture in which they grow up, it is not incidental, but absolutely crucial to their development as characters. In fact, the grappling with their Jewishness is the central issue of the novel. Meisel Hesse's main character, Olga, is not a personification of Nietzsche's Dionysian principle of creative release through intoxication. Meisel has in fact condemns this principle and all excess. She argues for restraint, for an adherence to the Darwinian principle of instinct and defined as a way of following the reasoning of nature, die Vernunft der Natur. And Landau, well, there's a different case altogether a case of deliberate misreading and misrepresenting with a view to silencing the author. Two reviews appeared of Der Holzweg in 1918 in the two leading periodicals read by assimilated German Jews. Both reviewers revealed Landau's female identity, which hadn't been visible, and instrumentalized this to discredit her as an author. They accused her of lack of political understanding, 
of not being in control of her emotions, but writing from hurt, the, the hurt of anti-Semitic aggression, and of a lack of creative originality. Now, this one is really an interesting one because they can't deny the obvious literary quality of the novel. They compare her to famous 19th century uh, author Fontana and Heinrich Mann, but they turn this into an insult as they imply that she's just copying the great. So why, why would they do that? Well, this is 1918. It's a period that saw a devastating wave of anti-Semitism as the Jews were blamed for the lost war. In this climate, most assimilated Jews in Germany fought all they could to convince their fellow Germans of the value of Jewish contributions to German culture and press the case for further assimilation in the hope of eventual acceptance. Now this novel, Der Holzweg, which declared the end of any dream of a German Jewish symbiosis and included vitriolic depictions of the undignified behavior of Jews assimilating further or even converting under the anti-Semitic onslaught, this novel was the last thing they wanted to see. They were arguing it's ammunition to the anti-Semitic uh, um, voices and it's undermining the German Jewish cause. So you can see their point politically, but as literary historians, as readers, we have to deplore the loss they inflicted. For the novel sank pretty much without a trace after these two reviews. It was the first of a trilogy, but neither the second nor the third volume were reviewed in any of the relevant publications. So here's a call to hack through the thicket. Let's go back to the archives directly, oppose disregard, refute mis misreading, and give a voice back to writers from, from and about whom we haven't quite heard enough yet. And to come back to the question that I asked in my title, but are they any good? Well, it depends on your criteria. Do these novels display aesthetic virtuosity, excellence within a carefully delimited and jealously defended artistic realm? Perhaps not. But do they engage with pressing societal issues? Do they do so with narrative deftness and subversive verve? They certainly do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gardela. Very stimulating talk, and it makes us want to get out there and do something about all this. It's terribly worrying. So thank you uh, to the three speakers. Um, I think what we can do now, uh, is this right, Eleanor and uh, Natalia, is to go straight on to the Q&A. We have, um, well, we've got um, at least a quarter of an hour, and there are quite a few um, questions here. So shall I just read them out for the uh, panelists to answer? Yeah. Okay, so the first one, the first question is for Godela, um, which is, um, which, of any of these women's novels would be deserving of reprint in German and or in translation? Uh, and is there any possibility of doing that? <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I've, I've been wishing for this, absolutely. It's the last one, the um, uh, Audnal, the Elisabeth Landau novel, which, as I was saying, is actually, from a literary standpoint, an extremely good novel. But also, it is just historically so interesting to see, you know, that in 1918, when everybody else was was still, you know, not everybody, but, you know, the, the majority of German Jews was working towards as continued assimilation. And she was seeing very clearly, we need to get out, you know, we, we do not have a future in Germany. Um, and, and then to ascribe, so the whole novel is built as a conversation between a, a German Jew who wants to reform uh, the Germans and wants to show them how, how important it is to have uh, uh, German Jews incorporated in the society. And this woman who is very clear sighted and says, no, you know, the, that cause is lost. And you know, to have the, the, the woman's voice as the one that is, uh, that is absolutely you know, far sighted and, and, and extremely well argued, that's a novel that I would wish we could um, we could find the sponsorship to um, to reissue absolutely. Thank you. Perhaps we can get into some funding applications 
uh, to do all these translations. Thank you very much. We've got another question now for um, everybody, I think, um, an anonymous attendee. Uh, and the question is, language seems to be increasingly changing through social media and data is growing in an unparalleled pace. Do you all think that will make archivists' lives much more difficult in the future as they try to unearth fascinating discoveries as you have? So Sarah, would you like to address that one? So there's too much information, basically. Yeah, um, yeah. I think there were kind of two parts to that, right? One, which is that that is social media is accelerating also a rapid evolution of language. Um, I think the question said, and then and then just the scale of it, right? So the the first one actually I think is a really interesting hypothesis. I don't know that social media is accelerating the rate of change of language evolution. Now it might be. Um, I haven't seen any study of that one way or the other. It would actually be a really really interesting thing to try to demonstrate. Certainly, as we know, and as I I think my talk was kind of implicitly demonstrating um, historical language use has always evolved. Um, but is it happening faster through social media? I genuinely don't know if that's the case. Um, if it is, then yes, it will make the job trickier to some extent, although um, you'll still find that certain uses stick. And once they stick, then they become part of the vernacular in a way that help, that helps them work as a heuristic for this kind of cultural work. If they if they remain very niche or very idiosyncratic, then obviously, or, or very short-lived, um, then, you know, they may have less historical and cultural purchase kind of by definition. Um, in terms of the scale of the problem, yes, it's huge. And that's why I was trying to suggest that there are ways of working through it because the, the mass archive and the reason I kind of call it a mass grave, it, the fact is it's already huge. It is vast and unscalable. Um, we already need computers to even begin to think about um, trying to find patterns through the whole of it. But even through a corner of it, like in my case, looking at American uh, periodicals and newspapers in the 1920s and 1930s, which is a very small section of it, is still vast. Um, and, um, and that's why finding a trope and, and finding that as a way to go through it, rather than necessarily trying to search for an individual, I find um, a useful way of doing it. And I'm not sure that that won't continue to be useful through the, the current, um, I mean, I can, you know, I can do it now um, with, with vernacular uses and say, okay, what's a kind of loaded term? What's the kind of key trope? Like woke right now, right? I mean, if you just started tracing woke through the way that it's being used in the archive right now, you would find a way to navigate. Um, you, you turn up a lot, yes, but you would still find a way to navigate it. And that's kind of what I'm what I'm suggesting is that we, is one way, not, it's not the only way, obviously, but that one way of thinking about it is to try to identify these kinds of lightning rod bits of language that can help us do this kind of textual navigation. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, Francesca Godilla, do you, have you got any comments about the nature of the archive right now because of social media and big data? Does it help you in your research? or hinder? I'm not Jessica? sure, I guess all I would say is that I, for biographers, it's going to be a very new challenge to start writing about people who, you know, had email addresses or social media accounts. And Indeed. I'm pretty glad that Virginia Woolf wasn't on Twitter, um, even though I mean, it was hard enough, you know, with the sort of massive of diaries and letters of someone like her who whose papers were kind of systematically saved. Um, but I think, you know, now I know contemporary writers are, you know, preserving their archives and, you know, sending hard drives off to, to libraries and it will be a I mean it'll be a, a gift but also a, a burden for for future um, biographers and researchers to work out how comprehensive they may want to be and I expect it'll be an exciting chance to to work out new sort of methodologies although I mean I think there are also kind of difficulties I remember reading a essay by um, the guy who wrote the biography of Susan Sontag saying that his her sort of her computer was was kind of degrading in some way, and um, and you know he had to sort of work out how to save the the kind of word documents with or, or floppy disks or you know technology that was becoming obsolete. So there may be sort of problems that we haven't we can't even anticipate now, even in just a few years. Yeah, absolutely. And and Godilla, would it affect oh, you? Just, just just a little point. I think um, you know because I'm. Uh, not so much interested in looking at the uh, the media um, uh, media representations, but more the authorial voices 
And um, of course, you know, if you look at uh, authors writing today, you have quite often, you have actual sort of parallel discourses develop developing, you know, people sort of talking on social media and, and you know, writing a different narrative or an extra narrative mm, uh, yeah. on top of what they are publishing. So I think, you know, to look at these different strands is, is an extra, you know, an extra avenue that we would need to go through. Yeah, we need we need more researchers, don't we? Okay, a question for Francesca. Thank you so much for your paper. Oh, this is from a, another anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you so much for your paper. It's fascinating. I have a question. When researching your book, did you come across any difficulties? Um, you mentioned how Jane Ellen Harrison's life is difficult to determine from the archive. So how do you overcome those obstacles? How are you able to construct her story? in spite of the gaps um the question's gone anyway in spite of the gaps that you you highlighted mm. <laughs> well i mean it's, it's difficult i suppose my answer would be that i i guess my i attempted to do it by sort of making clear where the gaps were and making the gaps kind of part of of the story um, and I mean I faced it in different ways with each of the the people I was writing about I mean Jane Harrison and Eileen Power both um, kind of systematically destroyed papers and so the the gaps are kind of part of part of their story and it's both sort of interesting to think about the ways that they might personally have have wanted to to be remembered or not remembered and to think of you know the ways that that the historians work um, gets you know what does get um, preserved I mean Eileen Power a lot of the work that I was most interested in from her was in the broadcast that she gave on the BBC to school children um, during the 1930s she was a, an academic historian but um, she strongly believed that the way to sort of instill kind of internationalist values for future generations was by um, by teaching school children a, an international world history um, and she did this by um, by broadcast broadcasting kind of world history lessons um, using kind of and this sort of very new program of um, BBC radio programs um, but not, none of the recordings um, survive so it was a kind of strand of work that um, that you know was just as important to her as, as her book writing for example but um, but that isn't something that is able to kind of survive in the archive so I suppose the question was you know, to sort of draw attention to where those gaps might be and to reconstruct through archive work as in as much detail as possible um, by doing you know detective work to find other sources where it's clear what you know and of course sometimes you don't even know what what you don't know um, and so I think it's it's part of the you know the fun and the challenge of, of researching someone's life to to try and you know, follow the trails and gather as much evidence as you can but I guess I'm interested in in kind of laying bare the research in the in the writing and kind of showing um, where the where the gaps are yeah absolutely um thank you um so um godela another question uh, from philippa uh to what extent did, did the educated german jewish writers use yiddish did some embrace yiddish literature did some actively reject it as a barrier to integration and progress and did many not know that language speaking only German and whatever the second language they had. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, so uh, it, it's very difficult to speak of the German Jewish population at that time, because basically um, you had very different um, strata of society. So the, 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 the leading voice, I suppose, were the assimilated um, uh, uh, middle-class Jews who, um, you know, who, whose names we know through, because they are writers, they are, they were in music, they were in film, they were, in, you know, they were absolutely everywhere um, and produced so much cultural, uh, so many cultural works. And they, you know, very much what they were, were, were trying to do was to, to, uh, to excel in cultural uh, uh, production and to, to, you know, to, not even deliberately to 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 show their place, but you know, as part of of German culture, and then on, uh, and they of course would not use Yiddish 
Yeah. And then uh, on the other hand, you had um, the, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a large influx from Eastern uh, European countries into Germany, of, uh, the, the, the Ostjuden, the, the Eastern Jews who, who came to Germany. And many of those spoke, um, spoke Yiddish. They, they came from, uh, you know, in many cases, from small towns, from, from villages even. Uh, they, they brought with them completely different culture. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of the klezmer music that we still know today, and, and the Yiddish, and the, the, the folk tales, all that kind of cultural um, context belongs to them. Uh, so, the, and there was no... There was no significant overlap, no no communication be between these two because they they were following different itineraries, different aims. Um, so yes, there are Yiddish texts, there are Yiddish novels um, uh, and, and song texts, etc. Um, but uh, they, yeah, they they went into a more Zionist direction um, and you know not into this sort of integrated into German culture direction. Very interesting. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, question for Sarah, anonymous attendee. Um, we now speak of the biases in the algorithm, in, in uh, quotation marks, in relation to social media, such as Instagram. Algorithms have been said to be racist. Do you think there could ever be a possibility where we achieve, we, uh, we create archives and algorithms that aren't biased? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> that's a really, really good question. Um, so first of all, I wouldn't just say that the that they have been said to be racist and biased. They have been demonstrated to be racist and biased. Ah. They are. Um, and um, and the, the archive itself is, in the ways that I was trying to at least uh, allude to, um, because it's over-indexed toward normative experiences, which were white male heterosexual, right? Those were the official approved, you know, authoritative um, accounts as we've all been um, addressing in our various ways. So the whole archive is biased in that sense toward those perspectives, toward those voices. They were the voice of official institutional archival language. Um, you know, you're talking, you know, the earlier you go, obviously you're talking about times when women couldn't publish when, you know, so it's just always skewing um, in that direction. So, um, but the algorithm itself also uh, absolutely has uh, biases in it. I mean, just think about the fact that if you do a basic, the, the kind I was talking about, the basic newspapers um, database search that I did where I just looked for ungovernable in a 20 year period, what does it give you? It gives you you can organize it by earliest, you can organize it by most recent, or you can organize it by most relevant, which is its default. Well, relevant is an interpretive value-laden judgment. Um, and on what basis does it decide relevance to the word ungovernable? <laughs> like, what's the, is it purely mathematical? Is it purely on a scale? Um, and if it is purely mathematical, that's still not objective because, as I say, the data is already over-indexed to the male perspective. So, pure, so what appears to be an objectively mathematical account simply replicates the bias within the archive. Um, so it's thinking through those problems. And one of the reasons that I like to approach it from this question of language is to recognize, therefore, that also the language is um, biased too. It always is. Um, so I'm afraid my answer is that, no, I don't think we can correct for it because because the, the human mind is biased. I mean, there's enough uh, psychology out there to show that bias is inherent in perspective. Um, what we can do is the kinds of things that are increasingly common now, like training for unconscious bias to try to become more aware of your unconscious bias. Although, of course, that's a paradoxical effort, a laudable one, but a paradoxical one. The more unconscious we are of it, the less likely we are to be able to become aware of it. Um, and so, but it is at least encouraging people to think in those terms, to be self-aware in those ways um, and to, you know, to not let the obvious biases uh, like, for example, I mean, you know, we will be conscious of the fact that we are here, a panel of white women um, talking about the experiences of women in uh, more comprehensive ways. And so the ways that some of those are structural, some of those are really obvious, some of those are things that you can try to correct for very consciously. Some of them are built into value-laden language, which is like ungovernable, which is why I was trying to get at that. One of the things that the algorithm does, which I'm really interested in and is part of a project that we've just, we're about to begin, we haven't even really begun it, um, is working in the archive 
um, with data science to look at the, because the, the, the algorithm is biased toward literal meanings because that's what the computer can find. Um, and it's not, they're not at all alert to figurative meanings, but that's the rich, the whole kind of richness of semantic communication is something that machines are not as good at finding as humans are. So how can we start to think through the ways in which we could figuratively map the archive, which is the direction that my work is going? So the answer is no, I don't think we can ever eradicate it, but we can certainly correct for it and we can enrich our perspectives definitely um, by becoming aware of it and working to resist it in the ways we've been talking about. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, question for Gordela. Do you think that these authors being both women and a religious minority were more inclined to support radical ideas therefore? Um. <laughs> That's a good question. I, I suppose the, the the question comes from the, the direction of you know they they are not mainstream anyway, so they might as well um, you know uh, uh, um, support uh, opinions that aren't mainstream. I th I think to a certain extent I would answer that with yes, because they are writing out of a recognition that the way things are is not a good way for them. So, you know, they are in, uh, and, and what I am so very impressed with is how they are using mainstream media and mainstream tropes as well to invert them and, uh, and basically, you know, yeah, subvert uh, majority thinking and, and, and get their, uh, their opinions out uh, in that way. The danger is, the danger is that sometimes that isn't picked up I mean, like for ex in the example that I gave you with the Hauschner novels, um, they have forever been read as novels where she acquiesces in the end, and um, uh, yes, she, you know, motherhood is is there for her, but actually it, it it helps her to find her way within Jewishness. But it does not, and it's a kind of it's an it. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, ingrained ways of perceiving, ingrained ways of reading, are so persistent. That you know, even though the text says different, you have to work against it, and you have to really, really dig. And this is, you know, what what, what Sarah was also saying. You know, it's this, it's this uncovering, exhuming. It's there, but you know, you have to find it. But sorry, that wasn't your question. No, uh, no, I think it was the question, and I totally agree with you. You have to go back to the originals, and you have to reread, and you have to read from a woman's perspective, whatever that is. But it's not what was before i find it all the time in uh, in my own research and you you can't go by what people have said about a text you have to go back and read it yourself yeah no matter what okay one more question um we've got time i think so this was for from um for francesca what was the most fun and exciting thing that you felt you discovered while you were researching your book bloomsbury is always depicted as such a vibrant place, not without its dark corners, as Jean Riss has shown, and not today, presumably, but anyway, do you think it lives up to its hype? And do you think that aura, that aura still lingers in the paths and streets of Bloomsbury? So there's a question for you, Francesca. I don't know if you've been down to Bloomsbury in the last year, but if you have. <laughs> yeah, not for a while. <laughs> well, I mean, Bloomsbury today is obviously so different. I mean, it sort of looks, or parts of it do look the same. So it can be quite a kind of eerie experience to to walk around and you know, still being able to see the some in some cases the very same trees and you know and statues and facades that um, that people like Wolf saw. But I guess its its character as an area has has completely changed. And you know now Bloomsbury the houses sell for millions and um, whereas in the early 20th century, it was a, a kind of radical place where, um, where in fact, this was perhaps one of the most interesting things that I sort of discovered. I guess I set out having established this coincidence of these of these interesting women having all lived in the same square. I, I guess I asked the question, you know, why why was it that they would have all 
um, come to, to this particular place. And so I went into doing quite a lot of research on the sort of architectural history of, of Bloomsbury and, um, and realized that it is a kind of accident of, of sort of, a, you know, con congruence of geography and, and social changes um, and that the area was kind of laid out um, by the Duke of Bedford at the start of the 19th century as a sort of up, upper middle class suburb with the idea that he would build these giant mansions, which, you know, wealthy nuclear families would live in and the ways the houses were designed were, very, were set up with that that family in mind with you know um, muse at the back for the horses carriages the drawing room for the you know, lady of the house um but by the time these houses were built fashions had changed such that any family rich enough to have bought one wanted to live in west london which was much more fashionable so these big houses ended up kind of languishing empty um, and eventually um, the landlords were losing so much money they decided to divide them up into flats um, or into boarding houses which meant that there were suddenly these kind of single rooms at a time when when it would be um possible for people to to sort of take take leases on them to live alone or with friends um at a time when many women were looking for different ways to live and um and arrange their lives so i guess um that was something that i sort of hadn't anticipated um, before i started but realized that you know of course areas do have to take on their reputations for for reasons um and that was um that was Bloomsbury's and in fact you know, discovering lots of, of people beyond far beyond the Bloomsbury group who had lived and worked in Bloomsbury at that time I think I would say it does live up to the height but in fact it's 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 more than the height for it it goes far beyond it, and there's always lots more to discover about it. Thank you uh, Francesca um I don't Elena do you think we've got uh, time for one more question it's 10 past one I think yeah, we have five more minutes. Oh, OK. All right, then. So um, a question here um, for everybody, I, I think, um, regarding analysing contemporary writing and thought, there must be people and their machines who are currently observing and archiving much of the current discourse on social media uh, and in comments to online articles. So I wonder how all that information will be made to future scholars and historians. I suppose, um, I don't know if any of you have some expertise in, in IT or in data storage to talk about this. Do, do you, Sarah? Uh, not really, but I, 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 as I said, I'm beginning a project um, around this, working with some digital humanities scholars. So by the time that's done, I'll have more expertise than I have right now, but at least I know what the questions are. And um, and what it really um, comes down to is the construction of archives. And mm. so that's really a question for archivists and to, for us to recognize that the archive isn't something that just happens. It's something that's built by humans. It's an act of curation. It always is. Um, it's an act of curation and preservation. So exactly in, in the example that you give in your question, you're talking about people who are choosing to collate, um, aggregate, and preserve these so that others can uh, use them. So part of the job of the archivist is to make sure that their archives are available to the researchers, which doesn't just mean professional researchers, obviously, um, to the researchers who want to use them. It may be that they'll find that they are um, able to uh, collaborate with um, some of the um, kind of uh, more open and um, familiar, for lack of a better word, um, aggregate websites, places that are, I, I'm thinking particularly of like genealogical websites, um, like Ancestry or Find My Past or those kinds where you can get, um, you know, all kinds of different archival records are collated in that one spot for people who are trying to search for one person. And they can go through newspapers, they can go through census records, they can go through marriage and death certificates, they can go through all of that kind of documentary archival um, research, and I imagine that they'll be needing to begin to collate um, internet data around uh, those kinds of lives as well. So that's just one place where I would imagine that they'll start to get aggregated, but people will aggregate them. And then once, and, and that's, that's the job, right, is in a sense, each of us was constructing an archive. Each of us told a story about us each going and put to, putting together an archive where there wasn't one, recognizing even these these were kind of micro archives that each of us made in this example um, and looking at three or four figures or in my case at one word and seeing 
what ha we create a little archive there and then we read the archive. So really that's what we're always doing in history. Sometimes the archives have been created for us and sometimes we have to create our own. Sometimes we put them together and then we try to read the archive. Yeah, yeah. Um, Godra, Francesca, do you want to say anything about, about the social media? I, it, not really anything I know anything much about, but uh, uh, what it made me think of is the um, the British Library, is it, uh, is, is uh, collecting um, uh, a sort of snapshot of everything that's available on the internet. Um, so, I mean, what a resource that's that's going to be mined for. Really. Yeah, they, they do snapshot it set between certain dates, I think. Otherwise, it's just mm -hmm. impossible. The yeah. infinite archive, yeah. Um, but, but like Sarah says, the, the, the interesting thing and the important thing about this is how do you get access? How are the search mechanisms steered so that, you know, so that you make sure that it isn't or that you are realizing that it's biased? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, OK, um, another question. If women throughout history were so often anonymous, a point Wolf herself made, then what are the bigger challenges of searching the archive for Anon? <laughs> anon, if you put Anon in, um, Sarah, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> oh, this goes back to me, does it? Um, if you put Anon everybody. in, you don't get, well, if you put Anon in, you will get signature, they will get lots of pieces that were signed Anon. What you will get is the si pieces that were signed Anon, um, particularly yeah. in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, more so than in the in the 20th. So again, you will skew your, um, your data. I'll let the others um, speak to it as well, but I'll just say quickly, that Anon isn't as much of a problem as it looks like because it just represents the problem that we've been talking about. Because the fact is, is that having a name doesn't solve the problem either. I mean, the 13 year old that I was looking at was called Florence Smith. Um, and I wanted to know what happened to her after her week in correctional facility. Did it ruin her life? Did she end up on the streets? Did she reform and become a, you know, a good middle class woman? You know, who knows? Um, Florence Smith was not enough for me to track her down, at least not without a lot more work, or I'd have to go to that correctional facility and see if it kept any record about what happened to her afterwards and then try to trace her that way. So unless the name is exceptionally unique, um, that doesn't really get you very far usually either with ordinary people because their lives just weren't newsworthy enough to be captured. And that again is Sidia Hartman's project too, is to say what happens to all of the anonymous people who had names even, um, but for whom the archive uh, considers them anonymous. So again, I think it's kind of built into the questions that we're all um, asking is that we're trying to uncover people who were forgotten and therefore anonymous, um, as in Francesca's examples, even when their names were known, they were and they were anonymized by being left in oblivion. Yeah, yeah. Francesca, any comments on that? I don't really, I suppose, um, I mean, Wolf's kind of this last project, which which becomes sort of the focus of my chapter on her, where she was going to sort of try and tell the story of, of English history and literature, kind of kind of through all of, of the anons. Um, I suppose her sort of method was going to kind of be to to sort of tell the story in a way of the social forces that have, have made people anonymous and have, have continually acted on on um on writers or you know the sort of development of of literature from a kind of communal practice um where the anony anonymity of the of the author was kind of embedded in in the fact that literature was was a kind of communal activity and mm -hmm. um and sort of embedded in in social practice which in fact is where she was looking back to jane harrison's book ancient art and ritual which describes the origins of of greek tragedy in in sort of communities coming together for um for kind of fertility worship to sort of bring on the new seasons um and so she sort of tracks the development of or the sort of shift from that sort of communal practice to an emphasis on you know an individual or named author you know writing separately from their reader um and you know and being read by by an audience who was outside of of you know rather than being writer and reader being part of the same community um so i suppose um yeah it was a a way of of telling the story of 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 anonymous or of you know of, of anonymous as as a, a sort of constructed figure um, yeah else. yeah and or as an individual indeed um well i think it's um so it's 118 um is uh, elena and natalia is should we finish now <laughs>
Yes, that would be brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone, for your contributions. I am on the verge of tears over here because everything was so fantastic. Um, thank you so, so much. Well, they were very stim absolutely stimulating talks and, and absolutely appropriate for International Women's Day. So well done, ladies. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. You get a virtual <laughs> hand clap. <laughs> <laughs> well, and a clap to Elena and Natalia. God bless her. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Feel free to join us again at two o'clock for our next panel, which will be feminism and intersectionality. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely, lovely afternoon. <laughs>